Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Kino Thomas from Kino Training Systems, and I have started another project, one of many projects. Um, this is called a Visual Pilot Operating Handbook Project. Um, you can read on your own through a lot of pilot operating handbooks, but this is actually kind of like a video that goes or works in conjunction with a pilot operating handbook or a POH just to help familiarize yourself with the aircraft uh, with aircraft operations or um, systems so moving right along here uh, that is me that handsome fellow right there <laughs> all right so the goal here um, or the objective of this project is to help Milviz F-15E users become familiar with the F-15E simulator systems navigation and procedures and VFR, which is visual flight rules, and IFR flight conditions. So, you guys will learn how to operate this thing. If you follow this series, you will learn how to operate this thing in all weather conditions. The F 15E is a high performance supersonic all weather dual role fighter built by, it should be McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Company. But I will recheck that. Um, it has an air to air and air to ground role, and it uses uh, pods, additional pods, or auxiliary pods like lantern or sniper pods for uh, targeting and uh, night navigation. Uh, I'm pretty sure it uses FLIR also, which is fo the forward looking infrared system. Uh, the engines are the FW Pratt and Whitney 229 engines. Now, up top we have a 220, which is an earlier engine used in an earlier model, but um, it just shows the cutaway and everything and we can see that the engines are in a afterburner state um, the aircraft appearance is characterized by a high mounted swept back wing and twin vertical tail uh, stub stabilizers so a pretty cool airplane the cockpit is elevated for uh, visibility and we have conformal fuel tanks which are kind of just really close to the body they're not far away that's all that means conformal form it kind of just adjusts with the form it's already there uh, the jet fuel starter we're gonna beat this to death and talk about it a lot but the aircraft can start itself by itself start itself by itself was that the correct way of saying it yeah it can start itself by itself we have a graphic here and we have the actual jet fuel starter taken out here we have a graphic where it is still mounted inside the aircraft and then they take it out and they pull it down and they maintenance it, service it, uh, do whatever, uh, maintenance it. That wasn't a good phrase. Service it. Let's go with that. And uh, we have the intake and exhaust part where this little turbine or generator kind of takes in air and then blows it out. Um, this little thing or this little monster actually powers the engines. Uh, it takes a lot of power to fire up a jet engine and so this is a little um, mechanism that makes that happen. Here in the cockpit in the simulator we actually have the knob, the jet fuel starter handle and it's just pulled out and we have the parking brake there to remind you okay if you're about to start your engines you might want to put on the brakes because your head will be in the cockpit you won't be looking around so for ergonomic reasons they kind of put that parking brake there which I think is pretty cool I like to be reminded to be safe here we have the Milvis cockpit in the simulator and we have the actual cockpit and I put this up because I want you to see how like dead on the simulator is I mean as far as the panel arrangement the instruments all the switches are fully functional um, so this is a very good representation I think Milvis is probably one of the better simulations or simulator companies out there I believe it because all the switches and everything in the sim work you could actually keep yourself sharp with your procedures and cockpit flows um, or your, your check your check flows or pre um, your checklist flows I'm sorry and you could just be at home and you can stay sharp if you haven't flown a plane in a while and you have a check ride coming up too you can just like kind of just boom fire up the simulator and you can just boom do your thing and go through the procedures and it'd be like you haven't stopped flying at all okay that was lengthy alright 
dimensions. You can read this on your own. You can read this on your own. Max gross weight is 81,000 pounds. The engines, we talked about that. You can read this on your own. All right, the air in induction system. How do we get air into the system? All right, how do the engines breathe? All right, well, air goes into the intakes. We can see the intake here, which goes into a air inlet system. This is the air inlet system. Now, the engine is all the way back here. So if we looked in here, okay, with the aircraft shut off, of course, um, the engine would be way, way back there, or the compressor blades would be way, way back there. Um, we have all of this, all this to deal with before we even get to the engines. And what we have is a system that can, um, as pressure builds up inside here, we can bleed off some of the pressure. That's basically what the air inlet system does. But um, I have a slide explaining that and it will do it in more detail. So air comes in, goes into the air inlet system. It finally gets the engine. This is the nose and the, or the beginning part of the engine, which is here. And then the compression, power, exhaust stages happen. And then the exhaust happens. And then uh, eventually the it's blown out of the back and you can see this aircraft here one actually taking off in, in a full afterburner state and you can see uh, this one preparing to take off or starting its takeoff roll so the air induction system two independent air induction systems three variable ramps a diffuser ramp and a bypass door so a variable ramp we have three of those we have the first ramp which is depicted by one so follow along as it goes to two I'll be talking about two three four and so on the second ramp another adjustable a third ramp another adjustable the diffuser number four diffuser and if you don't know what diffuser means, it is a thing that diffuses something in particular. An attachment or duct for broadening an airflow or reducing its speed. So we can kind of slow down or take away from some of the speed of the airflow and the pressures as well in this air inlet system before it gets to the engine. And we have a computer control that monitors that. And ebbs and flows or gives or uh, it lets out air and it traps air as needed, whatever the system thinks is best. And that comes back to our uh, IDEEC, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Then we have our by bypass door, which is pretty much fixed. The diffuser door lets air out through that door. So it's kind of like letting your dog out. Hey, buddy, you want to go out and play? And he, uh, rah, rah, and he runs outside. <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't find a better analogy for that. Um, and then we have a top view so you can actually see the bypass doors just pay attention don't pay don't mind all this other stuff the red arrows are pointing to the bypass door so from a top view we can see that 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 vent or bypass door is letting air out or relieving pressure or decreasing the flow of air uh, this all of this whole system is controlled by an, an air inlet controller that's what it's called an AIC or air inlet controller it's on the panels it's positioned right up there I'm gonna close in on it so you can get a better view but the air inlet controller one for each inlet uses angle of attack aircraft Mach number and other data or other air data system outputs to automatically schedule the ramps and bypass door throughout the aircraft and envelope all that is saying is as we speed up or slow down these variable variable doors adjust all right that's all I was saying so there's two conditions that these switches could be in they could either be in the auto or emergency and we'll go in depth but for our purposes right now we want them in auto I'm gonna go over emergency procedures later but right now auto is what we need it in where we're doing our checklist flow da -da 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 -da. so we have it here our air inlet ramp 
switches. And here's a closer view. Wow, we just like zoomed in like crazy. Inlet ramp. You can't see auto like you can see it here. This is why I provide both views. This is what it would look like in the cockpit as you glance down at the panel. This is a kind of blueprint view. So we have a right, we have two big switches. We have a switch to the left, two big switches, and then we have a landing light and anti-skid light. And if you follow, this switch represents this switch. These two switches represent these two switches, these two switches. This switch represents the landing light, taxi light, and this is the anti-skid uh, switch. So um, that's to help give you an idea of what we're working with as well as what it looks like in the cockpit so you are familiar with it when you see it. Hold the name of the game, familiarization. You can look at this on your own pause here for a second you can pause and uh, look at this on your own the ignition system the ignition system contains an independent engine mounted generator that's our, our that little generator we saw earlier and four igniter plugs two for the engine and two for the afterburner the ignition system now very very important our throttles play into this ignition system all right. These throttles right now, they could be all the way forward or they could be all the way back. But when they are all the way back, the fuel, it's in a fuel fuel cutoff state. All right. So as we get the other panels ready to start, what happens is we take it out of that fuel cutoff state. This is the right engine and this is how we kind of start it. It's like what we would call a finger lift. We lift with our finger and uh, gently apply some forward pressure and it comes into the off to a low idle condition. All right. Ignition remains continuous during engine operation. All right. So, as long as we have fuel, the intake blades are going to keep sucking in the air. The compressor blades are going to keep compressing. We're going to keep adding fuel or spraying fuel into the combustion chamber and getting our power. And then the exhaust is still going to happen. So. As long as we have fuel, the ignition remains continuous. It keeps igniting. Reminds me of a song, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, there is a pilot operating handbook. That's what POH means at millviz.com that you can get for the F-15E. Trouble is, a lot of people don't understand it. Hence, me making the videos and clearing it up. <clears throat> the engine control system. The engine control system. This is the engine control panel. All right. So what does the engine control system do? do? It controls the engines or power plants. I like the power plants. I don't like the word engines. So we have a dual system. All right. That helps uh, control the engine system. The first one is a digital primary control, which we would call primary, and then we have a backup hydrometrical secondary control. We will go into in depth to what that is, but right now the digital control is what we would call a IDEEC, India Delta Echo Echo Charlie. Right, sorry about that. Didn't mean to do that. Okay. All right. So our engine control panel. We're going to talk about our IDEEC later. But here's our engine control panel. We have uh, a legend popping up. We have our generator switches, which is one, and you can follow along as it goes along. Um, or we have our left generator, right generator, and we actually have an emergency generator. It turns on and off the generators. That's what the generator switches do. We have an external power control labeled by two. Uh, what does that do? It controls application of external power and uh, to the aircraft and electrical buses. We don't really use that in the simulator, but I am going to discuss it a little bit later. Uh, external power control could be in a normal condition, allows electrical buses to be energized by external power. Um, and we could have a research, uh, reset condition, which it's going to come right back in the norm because it's spring loaded. Uh, so number two, um, or it could be an off the, off condition, which we will keep it in the off condition for our purposes of simulation. 
Um, emergency generator three. We talked about that. It could be in the auto, manual, or isolate. We could take totally take it away from the system. Um, up, 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 up. Engine control switches. The engine control switches. They are used to place the engine ignition systems in a primary or secondary mode. Uh, we talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, bop, 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 bop. If we have the engine control switches, which are here in the off position, we cannot go into afterburner mode. So make no mistake, we can still fire these engines up with the engine controls off, but we're in a secondary control system, which means the IDEEC is probably not going to be functioning in that part. We have the engine master switches. The engine master, master switches are these two big green covered things here. And they're here, here. Here's the left engine master. Here's the right engine master. As long as these things are on, we could fire this plane up. Um, but we'd be in a secondary aircraft uh, engine or engine ignition mode. We want to be in primary and we want to have our secondaries a backup. So we would always make sure that these are on under normal conditions. But back to our engine master switches. Switches. These are guarded. Why are they guarded? They are guarded so we don't inadvertently, which means mistakenly, um, punch them or move them off. We could be flying through turbulent conditions and it would be a nightmare to bump that switch and knock it off in the off position when we're in flight. All kinds of neat, nasty things could happen. So we guard these switches. Um, because they allow or deny the operation of each engine and so when we want to allow it we don't want that messed with these are in a, a guarded state so the switches are actually flipped downward and then sorry where's my pointer the switches are actually the rocker switches like these where they go up or they go down when they're at an up position you could actually see the tip of the switch so this is a visual confirmation that these engines are in the off position. Very, very cool uh, for redundancy to make sure, to make sure, make sure that you know that those engines are off. And we talked about the jet fuel starter. Engine monitoring system. This is the engine monitoring system. This is what it looks like in the cockpit when the it is on all right so our engine monitoring system this is what it looks like when we're when it's off but this is what it looks like when it's actually on and we talked about the I call it the IDEEC but that's what it is now because it's an improved DEEC um, which is just an uh, uh, engine diagnostic unit that kind of keeps track of everything that's going on if anything weird happens. There's something called trend monitoring. Trend monitoring is just a system that kind of says, okay, well, you know what? In this kind of flight, um, a level flight at, I don't know, I don't know, minus 30 degrees, the engines use this much fuel or that much fuel. And it just monitors it and it just kind of sets a track record for what is going on with that particular aircraft or engines or power plants I should say so if there's any abnormal engine operation it keeps track of that any failures uh, are detected and they're flagged for maintenance so when a technician gets with this airplane and he checks the system he could be like okay well why did this happen at this altitude and they can investigate and uh, talk about this the air induction system. How do we get air into this aircraft? Um, give me one second. I'm going to have to pause. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, that brief interruption. Okay, so our air induction system, and I am turning off my cell phone right now. Or putting it on vibrate. Okay. So air in the, our, air, our air induction system, how do we get uh, air into the system? Um, I put this man on the right gasping for air. He just popped out of the water. And um, 
Let's talk about it. The air induction system. Two independent air induction systems. Each system has three variable ramps. These are the three variable ramps. And then we have a variable bypass door. So air comes in, as we can see here, into the intake, comes into this air inlet system, and these doors move in order to let air out. If the pressure got too much for the engines, we don't want air molecules building up. All right, we want continuous smooth flow. So this air inlet system helps that happen. If we look into the air inlet system, the air inlet um, system, we can see that there's quite a bit of distance before we even get to the engines. Here's the engine here, the actual nose of it. So this is a picture looking in or peering in. These are actually two pictures, um, but it takes a little while before we get there. So let's talk about our. bypass door. All right, the bypass door is like right up here. All right, so that's where the air is kind of let out. Here's the actual um, air inlet controller that you will see on the left side of the cockpit. All right, you see inlet ramp and we have auto and emergency. So those are the two conditions that the switches can be in, either in auto or emergency. Auto is what, when we scan our panels, for pre-flight or before we take off it should always be in the auto position you can read this on your own so basically for our air and in induction system air is sucked in through the air inlet system uh, it goes to the engine and then uh, it goes out the back our engine control system all right, our engine control system. Here is a picture of our engine control system. We have our generator switches left and right. We have a emergency, an emergency generator. We have our engine controls, and that's for our primary and secondary um, ignition systems. We have our uh, left engine master, jet fuel, uh, I'm sorry, external power uh, switch. We have our jet fuel starter, and then we have our uh, right engine master, or the right engine. Our left and right engine controllers here, engine control switches, are located in the front cockpit, and they have two switches that can be on or off. Whether it's on or off, we can still fire the engines up. The on or off turns on our IDEEC system, which is our primary means for ignition we always want it in that condition um, but as a backup we do have our um, hydro our hydrometrical or hydromechanical system but we will not be able to go into afterburner in the, with the second um, selection or the off selection main fuel control um, our engines control that our main fuel control um, and let's just Kind of jump in. We also have an engine monitoring system. The engine monitoring system kind of does what we call monitoring or trend monitoring. What we used to do back in the old days, right, was we take off and we level. We we'll level out the plane at I don't know, let's say thirty thousand feet. We level the plane out thirty thousand feet. We would note the outside air temperature. We would note the um, the RPMs of each engine, temperatures, engine temperatures, engine pressures, um, fuel flow, and all that and everything like that. And then what we would do is when we land it, all this will be on a list. And so when the maintenance crew do their maintenance on the engines or aircraft, they would look at this stuff and they would use it. Oh, you know, this, this airplane shouldn't be eat, uh, get, drinking this much fuel at this altitude at this rate. Uh, so all that is monitored. And so it's a lovely system. 
But now what they've done is they have an electrical system that does it. So I imagine that the technician just plugs into the plane, downloads the information uh, during a maintenance check. And uh, that's pretty neat. Less writing for us. We have enough paperwork. <laughs> All right, you can read this on your own. We have the afterburner system that is going to lead us into a nice video uh, from another YouTuber. Um, this aircraft is in a afterburner state. If we look at the picture on the bottom, this throttle, as you'll learn from my videos, can be pushed all the way forward into a maximum thrust condition and pulled all the way back to a idle or even fuel cutoff position. In addition to that, we have a variable exhaust nozzle. Um, you can read that on your own, but I've put in three different graphics to show you how, how the variable exhaust nozzle works. Here we have it, we're in a lower or low power condition or normal condition. And then when we want to use afterburner, we want to dump more fuel into the exhaust to give us more thrust. So to assist with that, we actually have a variable area exhaust nozzle that actually moves with the power setting uh, to adjust for that new thrust condition and you can see there's a video we're going to look at but you can see in lower power state and then we can see the engine going into an afterburner state and I think I'm like force gum that's all I have to say about that right now because I really want to go into the video you can see this and look at this on your own and that leads us to our video and then we will close and here we go we're as we're advancing the throttle we're pushing the throttle forward and then it's going to go into afterburner. And then we're going to pull the throttle back. But we can see what the variable area exhaust nozzle is doing. And then we pull the power or the throttle back down. And that be synonymous with closing the throttle. Before we close up, before we install this, this is an afterburner from the J79. And I want to show you this airspace. There's, There's the outside, outside of the engine, the after after river jet, jet pipe, right there. there. So there's, there's the inside, obviously. Right, right here, air, right there. Air goes into here and comes out the mixing air holes. The reason for which is to have a small, not a boundary layer, but an insulating layer of air between the metal and the hot flaming gases. So, so the, the hot, hot flaming, flaming gases, gases don't melt the metal. So this, this, this passage here is a passageway for pressurized air to come, come off the back, back of the turbine. Most of the air passes through here. Some of that air goes through here. But when we put fire and flame into the air here, it increases in velocity, but not in pressure. So this air, this air, you can come out through those holes and maintain that thermal protection barrier of relatively cool gases. The flaming hot fire is so 2500 degrees Fahrenheit and the air coming through the cooling air passages between the liner and the jet pipe, this air is going to be around 800 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is it's hot, but it's cooling air. It won't melt the metal, and it keeps the flame in the afterburner from melting the metal of the engine. Okay, so that was by another YouTuber by the name of Agent JZ on YouTube, which is at the top up here. And um, also, there's actually the... Uh, there's the actual address that you can type into your uh, browser in order to actually go to that video but I thought he did a very very good explanation I like the video he did earlier on with the afterburner and I like his uh, explanation you know you have you have temperatures of over 2000 degrees leaving but just a relatively cooler 
relatively cooler because it's still 800 degrees <laughs> it's not cool but it's relatively cooler it's 800 degrees it's not uh, 2500 or 2500 degrees and so that actually prevents this metal from melting which is very very interesting so we're gonna close right there because we're at the half hour mark I thank you guys for just subscribing there's more and more information that's coming out if you guys have questions all you have to do is just ask put it in the comments box it comes to my e my email and boom and I'll explain whatever you guys need so again thanks for watching this is Kino Thomas with Kino, with Kino training systems I thank you guys for watching have a great day